Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Strength to Strength. And uh, very happy to have with us uh, this morning, um, Austin Lapp. And I'll let him introduce himself. But the topic this morning is called Overcoming the Overwhelm. And I think it's a great topic that's going to apply to many, maybe all of us uh, in our business lives. And not only in our business lives, but even in our personal lives. Um, certainly in business, I can think of many ways in which I'm distracted and overwhelmed by the digital world. But I think it uh, comes much closer into our um, even our spiritual lives. Even um, I know lots of people can identify with, with me when I say that it's easy to become distracted even in prayer. And so, yeah, looking forward to, um, to this talk. And uh, Brother Austin, you're with us here this morning? Yes. All yes, right. So, um, yeah, let's uh, just open with a time of prayer, and then the time will be yours. Father, we thank you for this uh, time here together. Pray that this would be um, beneficial to us. May it be not only information, more information, but may it be instructive in organizing our lives so that we can become more productive for you in our businesses, in our even in our relationship with you and in all the interactions of our life. Just uh, pray that you would um, give us ears to hear this morning and um, may this be meaningful to all of us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, the, the time is yours. Looking forward to it. All right. Thank you so much, Glenn, for the introduction. And really great to be with you all here. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then introduce myself a little bit more here. So my name is Austin, and I'm married. My wife and I currently live in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we moved here three years ago to attend Satla College, and we've been very, very blessed by our time at Sattler, and even more so by our experiences in the local church. All right, so as I was saying, we, we moved here to Boston uh, three years ago and uh, have been very blessed with our, our time here. We've grown a lot. We've changed a lot. We've had, had deep and meaningful experiences, very challenging experiences as well. Um, so I'm, I'm currently a senior at Satla College, going into my last year, uh, graduating next spring with a bachelor's in biblical and religious studies and a minor in business. Earlier in 2020, last year, my wife graduated with a an associate degree in nursing. So she's a, a registered nurse. Uh, just a few days before our son Emerson made his arrival. Uh, I actually taught school for four years and thoroughly enjoyed that as well. And ever since I've been here in Boston, I've been working at an English center called The Bridge, where something, it's a, a ministry run by the local church where we're working with immigrants and teaching them English. So off and on over the last decade or so, I've been in the knowledge sector, so to speak. And, but it's only really been in the last two years or so where I've, I've really begin, begin, begun to recognize some of my poor digital habits and how they've shaped me and uh, fractured my ability to focus for long periods of time. And so I'm kind of on this, journey of starting to try to reclaim that focus. Um, so in 2020, obviously COVID was a huge theme of 2020. And about two months before our son arrived in May, Satla College went into online classes. And initially I was like, hey, this could be kind of neat. No commute time. Um, just get to zoom in from home. And, but I quickly realized that, that my, my digital world was going to bankrupt my semester if I wasn't careful. And I, I would reach the end of the day and it was, I was just utterly exhausted. And to make it worse, I felt like I had basically nothing to show for it. I felt like I had worked hard all day, but I could scarcely say, oh, this is what I accomplished today. In, in some sense, I, I would look like this car at the end of the day with smoke pouring out of my, my hood and pistons misfiring and, and all the things. And essentially, as, as one author put it, I think what, what I was trying to do is basically 
uh, diet with a mini fridge sitting on my desk or and filled with ice cream and soda. And it was just right there easily. I could grab a bite. And before I even knew what was doing, a quart of ice cream could be gone, so to speak. And, and to top it off, to make it worse, since I wasn't commuting, I had a few extra hours per week. I was doing far less uh, work study, part-time job, but it, it really didn't seem like that made much of a difference in terms of, of getting more schoolwork done. And perhaps you've had a similar experience in over, over the last year, especially where you've recognized that, that something is amiss with your digital world. Um, and, and you wish you could arrive at the end of the day looking more like this, <laughs> cruising, cruising home, well-ordered, clean, crisp, ready to interact with your family. Um, and so what I'd like to, to try to do today is to at least introduce the topic in, in terms of, of what are some of these things that make us reach the end of our day or our week and just feel completely overwhelmed and, and like we haven't really accomplished much. Um, so, so here's a, a brief roadmap of where we'll go today. So first we'll talk about some of the, the contributors to overwhelm and really, and then we'll move into tackling what I would see as one of the greatest challenges in, in our day. And that is the device that we carry with us wherever we go, our smartphones. Um, and then lastly, we'll look at a few specific tools to address some of the, the more general things. And a few caveats here before we dive in. I still consider myself a bit of a novice in, in this topic. I've only started really digging into it in the last two years or so. Um, I have discovered a lot of valuable tools that have helped me tremendously. I also realized that I'm a student and I'm not um, a full-time worker at this point. So I think it's going to be a little bit different. And uh, so a lot of the information here will be geared towards or will be speaking from my experience as a student. Uh, and then a few names that you'll hear throughout the talk. Uh, most of these are secular, but important in terms of recognizing the some of the devastating impacts of the digital world. So one is Cal Newport, who's a computer scientist, um, professor, and who has done a lot of important work in, in terms of, of digital, the digital world and deep work. Um, another one is uh, Stephen Covey, who has a great book called First Things First, really recommend it. Tristan Harris from the Center for Humane Technology and then finally, David Allen, who's kind of a productivity guru. And at the end of the, the slide here, uh, I have a list of sources as well as some resources. And I'll, I'll share a PDF of my slides with uh, Glenn, who can post them to the website then. And additionally, I, I feel like I'm, I'm speaking to an audience that I'm, I'm not entirely sure like where everybody's at. So I hope that that regardless of where you are, if, you, if you're not really a knowledge worker, um, as in someone who interacts with a lot of information, primarily works from the digital platform of some sort. Um, I'm, I'm still confident that, that some of what I'll be sharing today will be very applicable to you. So, so let's, let's go ahead and dive in here. One person has called the, the rise in technology, and especially in recent years, the race for our attention. And as we dive in here, I think it'll become clear why this is. Computers have been around for a long time. They're, they're nothing new, <laughs> perhaps. And, and, but what really changed is in the 1980s when the personal computer came along. And again, computers have been around for a long time. I think it was the late 1800s already when the U.S. Census was using single purpose computers to do computing work in their offices but they were single purpose. And what made the, the personal computer so revolutionary was the immense uh, possibilities that it carried. It was so diverse and it's only grown more diverse as time has gone on to where now we carry something in our pockets that's more powerful than some of the first supercomputers even. And then later in the 2000s, in 2007, a man named Steve Jobs launches the iPhone. And initially, it seemed like a, a fairly uh, benign uh, endeavor. So really trying to eliminate the need for two devices. So people who carried around an iPod for music and then others who carried around a phone for contacting people. And what he was trying to do is to bring those two together. And that's simply what he wanted to do. 
It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, but that, but just a few years prior, Facebook had been launched at this point. So this was 2004. And at this point it was simply a, a social networking platform only for Harvard college students. And over time it opened up to other Ivy league institutions and then eventually went public to where anybody could create an account uh, on Facebook. But what, what really happened then in the late 2000s was kind of laying the groundwork for the, so, the rise of social media platforms. And, and we've only seen this plethora of social media platforms develop since. Like it's just been an exponential growth. 2012 was a pivotal year for Facebook. And, and the reason that the iPhone was important was because it, it gave Facebook the opportunity to monetize their mobile app. And by monetizing it, this means that they began showing advertisements to their uh, account holders. So they launched this in March of 2012. And by October, the revenues from these advertisements for Facebook had already taken up 14% of their total revenues, 14% in a matter of months. And it's only grown since then. I checked recently, and I think it was just a few years ago, it was at 92%. So what this tells us is that social media platforms, Facebook in particular, but many others, recognize that if they can get our eyes onto the screen, if they can capture our attention, and the longer they can do that, the more money they can make. I've heard it said that um, Silicon Valley is not programming apps. They're programming people. They're working very hard to understand human nature, the way humans interact with the digital world and are using this information to create more sticky uh, applications, more sticky devices and so forth. And then throughout the 2010s, uh, we've seen just a proliferation of very specifically engineered devices and applications. And these, these, these various things have, like we've seen this exponential growth in the digital world. And, and this, this sharp rise in recent years. Tristan Harris noted in a 2017 TED Talk that much of the conversation around advancing technology has centered on the point at which it overtakes human strength. So in other words, when does technology start to replace us? When does it start doing the things that we do? And, and then we, we essentially step in the background. So this has been a big conversation in the artificial intelligence world and so forth. But few people have thought about a much earlier point on this timeline when technology overtakes or overrides human weakness. So it... What, what technology has started to do, especially the social media realm, but technology, uh, the digital realm in general even, has, has really hacked our, our psyche. It's, it's um, exploited our ability to be manipulated, to, to make us feel certain emotions, to, um, to believe certain ideologies. It's, it's hacked our ability to, to take control of our time our attention. It's, it's hacked into our, our gullibility to believe certain things. Uh, it's taken away our control of time. And, and really, there's been a lot of unintended consequences. And these are largely the things that contribute to the overwhelm that we experience. So one of the, one of the interesting things about the digital realm is that these non-important things start to feel very, very urgent. If you're a heavy social media user, you may recognize this feeling in, in terms of, so you might post something on social media and all of a sudden you feel this urge to continually check it to see how it's doing. Have, have people been seeing it? Have they been liking it? How are people responding to it? And maybe you have a dozen comments even. Well, all of a sudden you have these, these dozen uh, scheduled slots in your brain essentially that are saying, hey, at some future point, you need to go look at this comment and respond. Or perhaps you send out a, a, a message of some sort. And, and all of these things create these little scheduled periods of time in our minds and in our, our, our days 
that are sapping us from being able to focus on the things that we really want to. One of the very interesting fallouts from this rise in the digital realm has been this decreasing ability to read long form. And by long form, I mean a book, I mean a journal article, or even a blog post. Uh, in, the, in the world of Twitter and um, Snapchat and Facebook and all these different things, everything is, is so tweetable. <laughs> it's it's got to be short and succinct and just... And so people have been losing the, this ability to read a book. And this is actually... Uh, something that is developed in Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows, and the subtitle is What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And it was this, this research that he did was catalyzed after he started knowing, noticing this uh, alarming trend in his own life where he was having increasing difficulty to sit down for long periods of time and get lost in a book or even reading an article and being able to, to fully comprehend and, and, and interact with the author's arguments. And as he talked to his colleagues, he noticed that, that this was an increasing theme, that many people in the knowledge world were expressing similar sentiments. They were having more difficulty reading long-form material. There's another interesting um, contributor here, and it's attention residue. So again, remember earlier I mentioned that uh, the Silicon Valley and the social media uh, moguls are not programming apps, they're programming people. And some people have called them attention economies. So they're basically these economic models that are, are founded upon and, and need human attention and focus for at least short periods of time to be able to survive. And, and what this has resulted in, in this proliferation of devices that have a million uh, task capabilities uh, leads to this multitasking. And most people say, yeah, I can multitask. I can, I can be checking my email while I'm writing this report or have it open at least. But what few people realize is what's happening in the brain. There's really a tension residue where if I, if I break my focus on one project that I'm working on or one task and I, I flip over to something else, I go check my email or I open the WhatsApp message that just dinged, what, what we don't realize is that our brains can't make these rapid fire switches like we wish they could. And what we have is this attention residue. In fact, one, one person has said that um, it or has estimated that humans spend an average of one hour a day dealing with distractions and trying to get back on track. And this actually um, ends up being in the neighborhood of five weeks of time in a year. So it's a lot of time that we invest in, in trying to deal with these distractions that we're facing and trying to get back on track. Um, Cal Newport has a quote where he says that when you switch from from task A to task B, your attention doesn't immediately follow. A residue of your attention remains stuck thinking about the, uh, your original task. Additionally, uh, people have noted in, in a study that the mere presence of your smartphone decreases your cognitive ability. So this was a study done in 2017 and this is just a, a summary paragraph from the study. And this is what they found. They said the mere presence of these devices of smartphones reduces available cognitive capacity. So just having your phone on your desk at work or in, the present, in your presence when you're having your, your morning devotions or in the, in the room even decreases our ability to focus in the moment whether that's focusing on a project, whether it's even focusing on a person. I mean, this has massive, even relational implications, where if we, if we have our phones with us in, in meetings or in conversations, there's, there's something happening that our brains have been wired because of the way that these devices are structured uh, with notifications and all of this, um, that, that it reduces our ability to be fully present. 
So we've, we've talked about the non-important things, uh, de decreasing ability, attention residue, and then there's another one, and it's simply this information overload. There's a man who lived in the, the 1900s um, who came up with this thing called the knowledge doubling curve. And basically what he tried to do was to say that in the year 1 BC, if we could take the sum total of human knowledge and call that one knowledge unit, when would it double and so forth? And uh, initially it was like, I think 1500 years before it first doubled. And then it was about half of that, um, 750 years or something. And, and then it just kept getting less and less and less and less. And, and today, like the, the amount of information that is being spewed out of the digital realm into our lives is completely incredible. Like it, it's, it's, it's dizzying and our brains cannot keep up with it. For example, YouTube made this announcement in 2017. They said that people around the world are now watching a billion hours, a billion hours of YouTube's incredible content every single day, every 24 hours, people are spending in, in total a billion hours on their content. That is just unfathomable. And another one from the Domo report in 2019, Americans used, I'm just, I'll just throw the question out first. How many, how many gigabytes of internet data do you think Americans used in 2019? Well, it was about four and a half million gigabytes. That's crazy. But what's even crazier is that it was every single minute Every single minute, Americans as a whole are using four and a half million gigabytes of data. Like that, that's just an unfathomable, unfathomable amount of information coming at, at our minds. And finally, just simply fractured focus. Many people have lost their ability to focus on something for long periods of time. And I would say that I've largely fallen into this uh, state where... <laughs> Um, for, for a long time, I, I had some social media, I didn't use it that much, but used a smartphone like most people did. And what I started to recognize, though, was the ways that it was, it was really harming my ability to focus and to think deeply about topics. And this is concerning, and it should be. I, I think we could call this digital discipleship, where many people are being discipled by their devices. And I say this largely based off of some of those statistics that I just gave about the sheer amount of time that people spend in the digital realm. Some have called uh, this verse here in Luke 640, the iron law of education. That everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So the question really becomes, who is teaching us? And I think if most people are honest, we have to say that, that we are being taught at least in part, by our devices. The stakes are high. The church needs strong Christians who can think deeply about contemporary issues and articulate biblical solutions and answers to the world's problems. The world needs people who are able to think clearly about these and to take a stand against some of these attention economies. Our workplaces need men and women who are, are fully able to be engaged in their work and to produce high quality work. And finally, our families, our families, our children, our wives, our husbands, they need spouses, they need children who are fully present and who are able to engage relationally. And finally, just think about the giants that face our world today. These attention economies for one, radical Islam, how about gender dysphoria, terrorism, to name a few. So how do, we, how do we even begin to formulate a response? So let's, let's dive in. So the first one, the first thing I wanna talk about is more like this conceptual framework. Many people have adopted this approach that, that Cal Newport calls the any benefit approach to technology. So basically, if you can find any possible benefit to use this, or even if you think you might miss out on something, you should use it. You should download the app. You should get the, the web service. You should sign up for the subscription. Just get it. If, if there's any possible way that it will benefit your life, embrace it. And this is often the, the default uh, approach that people have. And, and I think that I've had it largely. Like 
when I, I began looking through my applications on my phone, like I, I discovered that there's many on there that I don't use. And I had downloaded them in a moment of being like, you know what, I think this might benefit me someday, but not having a clear uh, picture of what that benefit would be. And so it, it resulted in a lot of digital clutter. And the question here is really, why shouldn't I download it? This is kind of the question, or why shouldn't I sign up for this? Well, if you think about a craftsman, a cabinet maker, someone who does concrete work, or uh, even a farmer, they're very selective about the kinds of tools that they use. They don't just think, oh, this might benefit me someday. They think carefully about it. And so we should adopt this craftsman approach. Instead of just saying, hey, is there any benefit or is there something I'm going to miss out on? We should say, wait, what really determines the success and meaning in my professional life, in my personal life, in my academic life, in the church life, and then only adopt a tool if the positive impacts on these factors substantially outweigh the negative impacts? And here the question is really, why should I download it? Why should I sign up for it? Why should I buy this instead of why shouldn't I? So with this in mind now, let's, let's tackle, I think, per perhaps the, the greatest uh, challenge, and that's simply our smartphone. So I think to start with, a good place to, to start would be to simply ask your spouse, uh, one of your children, a close friend, or even a coworker, what they see your relationship with your phone like. Like, how does it affect your human relationships? Ask someone else what their perspective is on your relationship with your phone. And, and hopefully that can serve as a, a, um, a wake-up call in some sense if you're, if you're skeptical. And then start to dumb it down. Dumb down the smartphone. Remember, I, I talked earlier about how the personal computer revolution led to these devices that have so many different um, ways to be used and tools and all of these things. And part of while that might seem incredibly beneficial to us, it can also be incredibly detrimental. And we have to think carefully about how we control this. So the first thing that I, that I would recommend is to simply have your phone in a do not disturb mode by default. And now a caveat here is that some of you have a business phone and you're, the business world and all of that. And that's not something that I've, I've been heavily involved with up until now. And so obviously some of this will need to be tweaked according to your, your current situation. But basically, uh, smartphones are powerful and they can be customized. So for example, maybe you, you, uh, you have it in do not disturb mode, but then you have certain contacts that are still able to call you. So for example, on my phone, if I star a contact, they're still able to get through to me. And so my wife understands that if she needs me in an emergency, that she needs to call me instead of sending me a text message. Um, if, if it's, if it's something that can wait for a while, but she just has a question or whatever, she can still send a message. It'll just be a while until I get to it. Another thing is simply have a bland background. Uh, remember our attention, our focus is, is, is really swayed by the things in front of us. And so simply by, by having a bland background, a single color, um, or a very, uh, non- capturing picture or something can, can really help to eliminate that pull towards the device. Optimally automate settings. So for example, in, in many smartphones, you can say, okay, I want to go into do not disturb mode at this time of day. So maybe you say, you know what, I can't be in, I need, I need to, to have access to people throughout the day. Okay, sure. What about saying at, at 6 p.m. every day, my phone goes into do not disturb mode? That basically means that um, I don't get notifications anymore. Uh, and then I can be, and it doesn't start again until 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. or whatever it might be. Um, and additionally, maybe your phone has a setting similar to a focus mode where you can select particular apps uh, particular notifications that you want turned off when it's in focus mode and you can program it to say, okay, I want to, I want this time of the day, every day to be a focus mode where I'm completely blocked out from these other things. So setting it up to just automatically kick in is a huge benefit. And ultimately what these things are trying to do is increase friction. The more friction that we can uh, implement towards 
uh, interacting with these devices is good in many ways. And, and finally, simply turning off almost all notifications on your phone and your computer. Um, and obviously, again, customize this to your situation. Uh, don't ruin relationships or anything like that uh, it, or harm yourself. But I have a, one final value analysis filter that I'd like to challenge you to consider. And in this, in this filter, it's asking one question about every app or tool on your phone. And the question is this, will removing access to this app or digital tool significantly harm you academically or personally? Will it harm you if you remove access to it? If the answer is no, then I would challenge you to delete or remove it for 30 days. Do a little experiment. Do it with your family. Do it with your coworkers. Delete it for 30 days and see what happens. And if you want, you can keep a list of the things that you deleted. So if you decide you want to go back to them after the 30 days, feel free. If the answer is yes, that it will harm you, you can keep it. But define your relationship to that app or tool. So what this means is, is basically answering these questions. When will you use this app? Where will you use it? And how long will you use it? When, where, and how long? So let's look at a few examples of what this might look like. So for example, if, if let's take email. So one thing that I've tried to do is to simply block it by default. I can't delete it off my phone, believe it or not. Um, so I have it blocked by default. I don't want to be checking email on my phone. That's a computer job in my mind. So how do I respond to this then? So my goal is to simply access email three times a day in my office. So maybe an emergency check in the morning. And what I mean by that is simply scanning it. And are there any things that, that are really important here that need action right now? Then again, over lunch break. And then at the end of the day, during my daily shutdown ritual or routine, I try to get my inbox down to zero. And I have a, a system that I go through for that. I won't get into it much here, but if you're interested, there's lots of, of resources online to, um, to walk you through that. Another, let's take any social media site. So Facebook, Twitter, whatever, even YouTube. Delete it on your phone. Simply don't need it on your phone. Um, and then access it on your laptop if you feel like you still need it. But only log in once per week or something, or maybe twice, but define when and where. So for example, if, if I would still use Facebook, which I don't, Maybe I would say, okay, I'll log in on Sunday afternoons in this hour window. And don't save the password on your laptop. That's, again, increasing a little bit of friction. Maybe you have to, you write down your password somewhere. You have to go get it and put it into the, into the login page and then access it. Just increasing that little bit of friction can make a lot of difference. So this is one way to think about using your phone. And again, a caveat is simply, it's going to depend on your current situation. And another caveat that I'll, I'll throw out here is that, that some of what I'm sharing here is my high ideals. Like I'm still working towards this myself. These aren't things that I've fully attained to. And I'm constantly tweaking and, and kind of redoing how I think about my relationships with my devices. So that's that would be like my um, recommendation for how to interact with your phone. I've done a, a, what I call a digital detox challenge at Sattler. I did it for the first time last year and I'm doing it again this fall, where basically I'm challenging students to work through that value analysis and ask that question and actually do it as a group. Okay, we're going to delete everything on my phone that does that, that uh, the loss of this or lack of access will not harm me, especially academically, because that's what students are really concerned about and, and go through it. Um, so I've done versions of this probably twice now, and it's been very helpful. And even in, prep, in preparing for this talk, I again went through the apps on my phone. I'm like, wow, how did, how did these get here? <laughs> and, and just deleting a bunch. Um, and, and it may vary some on your stage of life. So for example, I was traveling a lot this summer. And so I had a few airline apps. Um, I used email a little bit more on the go and so forth. Um, so obviously be reasonable with uh, the situation you're in. 
I'd like to move now into a kind of an organization section here. So a lot of us simply have a dizzying amount of mental, digital, and even spatial clutter that, that really slashes our um, cognitive Achilles tendon, so to speak. And what many people fail to appreciate is the amount of work that organization takes. And often we kind of think that, hey, if I can just continue existing in my default mode here, I'll get through it. I'll be successful. Um, the, the founder of Sattler often says, you don't know how much your lack of organization is costing you. You don't know how much your lack of organization is costing you. And there's like this, this initial investment, essentially, of time to, to kind of get things organized. And then... Um, investment of, of maintaining that organization that in the long run will pay off dividends. Cal Newport says that there's several driving principles of organization. One is that clutter is costly. Clutter is costly. It costs us attention. It costs us focus, which could cost us uh, poorly made decisions, which could lead to lost money in a, as a business which can lead to uh, spiritual bankruptcy in the long run and so forth. Clutter is costly. Secondly, the optimization is important. It takes work to optimize devices, notifications, all these things in a way that, that facilitates your values as opposed to undermining them. Big difference. And the third thing is that intentionality is satisfying. And this is one thing that I've discovered uh, is that I actually love being organized. And I've become a bit of an organization freak in some ways where I, I, I just like to structure my, my computer, my folders, my notes and everything in a way that makes it easily accessible. It's orderly. It's, it's, it looks nice. And there, there can be a ditch in some sense, I think, where, where you spend so much time organizing that you might not get work done. I call this pseudo work. <laughs> you think you're getting work done, but you're just in this kind of this spinning state of organization, but it has been incredibly satisfying to me to work on this. And I'll walk you through a little bit of what that's looked like. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to talk about this term open loops. And really what an open loop is, is anything that pulls on my attention because it doesn't belong where it is the way it is. So it, it exists because I haven't clarified the outcome that I want to see with this thing. I haven't specified a next step. I haven't put a reminder in a system that I trust. Uh, two quick quotes here from David Allen. He says, random, non-actionable, but potentially relevant material, unprocessed and unorganized, produces a debilitating psychological noise. The second one, the vast majority of people have been trying to get organized by rearranging incomplete lists of unclear things. Incomplete lists of unclear things. So David Allen developed something called the GTD solution, getting things done. And he details it in his book. And I'm, I'm just going to quickly talk through the basics of it here. Um, to really benefit fully, I would encourage you to get the book and, and read through it and then set aside a few days to implement the system. Uh, this is basically what I did, and I found it incredibly uh, helpful. And we're running short on time here, so we'll just kind of skim through the basic structure of it. But essentially, it's, it's trying to, to find a way to take all of the random stuff in our lives, the emails, the phone calls, the tasks, the assignments, the projects, the, the, this little calendar event, all of these different things, and to put it through a filtering system to process it in a way that, that clarifies it. So it's, it's asking the question, what is it? Is it something that's... Uh, is it a reference thing? Is it an action item? Is it actionable? If the answer is no, then it, you either throw it away, you incubate it until a later time, or you file it away in a reference system. If it is actionable, it's Im important then to, uh, to define, okay, what is the next step? Is, are there more than two steps needed here? And if the answer is yes, then we would call it a project and we need to, to, to build that out. Um, and so in, in the, the kind of the basic um, system for GTD is, is really, um, sorry, is, is creating a way to capture information. 
So using a digital inbox where whenever you have a thought, a crazy idea for work or a crazy idea for this assignment, whatever it is, capture it. And it goes into what's called a digital inbox. So I use Evernote for this. Um, and also having a physical tray as an inbox. So mail that comes in, any papers for you, goes into this inbox. And then it gets processed and taken through the system. And again, if it's an actionable item, it gets put into a task management system. I use Asana. Um, there's many other different tools out there, Microsoft To Do, Google Tasks, um, Todoist. There's, there's many different options and, and exploring those um, would be beneficial. Again, I feel like I'm just skimming the surface here, but that's kind of the basic structure. And then two, two really important pieces of it are doing a daily shutdown. So being at the end of your day and being able to say, okay, I've, I, I'm at inbox zero. I've got all of these things taken care of. They're in the system that I trust. And now I can, I can let that go. I can go home, be with my family. I can go spend time with the church and I can be fully present. And then a weekly review, which includes, again, inbox zero, getting everything processed and, and then creating a plan for the following week. However, I think one of the biggest weaknesses with the, with the getting things done system is that it doesn't tell you what things align with your values. So essentially what can happen is you can get a lot done. You can accomplish a lot of things. But how do you know if you're accomplishing the right things? How do you know what, what is really important? And... I found Stephen Covey's First Things, First Book, a very helpful corrective. One of the, the major concepts he talks about is uh, determining your roles in your life. So, for example, maybe you're a business owner or a, a um, human resources manager or you're a husband, you're a pastor, you're a lay member. Whatever these roles are, these important things in your life, asking the question about that role, what one practice or accomplishment this week would have the most positive impact as a student, as a father, as a business owner. What well, one thing. And then instead of just letting that kind of go, like scheduling it into your week, scheduling the rocks right away. And essentially what this does is it prioritizes your values and says, okay, these are the things that are really important to me based on my values, based on my roles, my responsibilities. And I'm going to put those rocks in the jar first. And then the sand comes later. The alternative, I think the picture illustrates as well, is that if we don't do this and we kind of just let the week happen, we get to the end of the week and we've had a plethora of, of unexpected things come up and these little sand particles <laughs> that have filled up our week. And then we get to the end of the week and we're like, I haven't accomplished anything meaningful as a father. I haven't done anything meaningful for my wife this week. And these big rocks get left out and it, it becomes a, a, a big problem. So again, I would, I would highly recommend exploring that resource more. First Things First by Stephen Covey. The, I have two more things I want to briefly mention here. One is what I call autopilot scheduling. Um, so I'll just briefly walk through this here. So really what you're doing is setting boundaries around your values. You're saying these are the things that I value and then scheduling priorities. So similar to what I just mentioned with the kind of scheduling those rocks. Um, for example, one, one author that I've, I've read a lot was he's a secular man, but he, he's done a lot of work in this field. Um, so in, as of 2008, so this is a few years ago, he was doing, he was at MIT, which is a very demanding um, school here in Boston. He was doing research, trying to come up with ideas for his dissertation. He was a teaching assistant, taking courses, running his own blog. He was researching for another book. So he had a lot going, in other words. And this is what he said. I work from nine to five on weekdays, and in the morning on Sunday. He set boundaries. He said, I'm not working past five. I'm not working before nine. And I work a little bit in the morning on the weekend. <laughs> and yet he, he accomplished an incredible amount during that time. So one of the things that he, he mentions is this, this notion of an autopilot schedule where you take regularly occurring tasks and you assign it on a specific day of the week. So this is an example from my uh, spring semester where I said, okay, my Greek reading for Monday, I'm gonna do that on Friday at this time slot. On Friday afternoon, I'm gonna create flashcards for next week. On Saturday morning, I'm gonna do the reading for this class. 
and just like setting those things in place. Um, and, and then just, and putting it in your calendar perhaps, or in some kind of weekly plan where you don't have to make these decisions as you go throughout the week. Like it's there and you could just live into your week. That's why it's called an autopilot schedule. And then these non-regularly occurring tasks, like very complex projects, um, building it out with, with bench stone, benchmarks and milestones, and then creating weekly spaces, say, okay, Friday mornings are my optimal time to work on long, long-term projects. So maybe I have this, this upcoming deadline, I need to finish the budget, or I need to finish this paper, whatever it is. But it's, the deadline is three months out, and we don't feel that sense of urgency for it. But if we can begin to create small blocks of time every week where we're making progress on this, it can go a long way in easing that overwhelmed feeling as we approach the deadline. Uh, two quick tips on this. One is work hard to break down these big, scary, ambiguous things into small bite-sized pieces. So for example, here was an example I, I've used before. So the, the project was uh, for a class and I, I broke it down into at least four tasks that get me started. So choosing an option, choosing the organization to highlight for this, for this particular project, spending an afternoon doing this, and then drafting some questions. So these are like the basic steps of what I needed to do to get started. So taking that big kind of amorphous, difficult to define thing and breaking it down into actionable items. The second thing is considering your natural work rhythms. So um, Bryant asked me earlier if I'm a morning person and I am, and that's, that's like my peak time, early mornings to mid morning or even to late morning. Like that's when I uh, am at my optimal <laughs> ability to focus and, and to get work done. Some people are different. Some people are night owls. And, and this is a really interesting idea that Daniel Pink has, has been propagating where trying to understand ourselves in terms of, he says that, that every person goes through these three things every day, a peak, a trough, and a rebound. And, and that, that these, we should think about the kinds of tasks that we schedule into our days based off of our kind of our natural ability. So for example, a morning lark like myself, a morning person, will have a peak first, a trough, and then a rebound. Whereas an evening person might have a trough. It's, it takes them a long time to get started. They might peak in the middle of the day and then have a rebound at the end of the day yet. And so thinking about, okay, what kinds of tasks should I put into these time slots uh, based on my natural uh, tendencies? The final thing that I wanna talk about here is time block scheduling. This is something that Cal Newport uh, highly advocates for. And he claims that knowledge workers can get twice the productivity by doing this than those who don't. I don't know if I've, I've quite experienced it. I'm still, I guess, working on it and trying to perfect it. But the basic idea is this, that you block out the hours of the day. And you can kind of see this on the side here. I have the, the hours listed. And then schedule those blocks of time. So maybe start with 50 minutes or even start with 30 minutes and just say, okay, these 30 minutes of the day, this is the assignment I'm going to work on. This is the project. These are the tasks and then stick to it. And then if you run up against a problem or you need to adjust things, draw out your adjustments. So here you can see that I've had a, I had a little bit of adjustment on that day, adjust it as needed, but then keep going and schedule out the rest of your day. So those are some of my touchstones, I guess, or touch points as far as like getting organized, getting productive, uh, things that have really helped me. Um, so I guess in conclusion here, start by identifying those things that, that make you feel overwhelmed and then implement some creative solutions. If it's your smartphone, don't be afraid to dumb it down, uh, to, to take some radical steps with it. Um, finding creative ways, there, there's lots of resources. I have some listed here at the end of the, the last few slides. Um, explore it, start talking about it with your coworkers, with your family, and, and try to adopt a craftsman approach where you're thinking carefully about how does this tool contribute to me fulfilling my purpose in life? How does it build and facilitate my values as opposed to undermine them? And then ultimately, I think what we all want is to, to be producing high quality work, whether that's um, as a business owner, as an administrator, as a student, as a pastor, as a lay person, that we're, we're working to edify the church and to change the world ultimately. 
And, and I really think that, that by working hard to, to overcome the overwhelm that we feel will free us up to become better servants of Christ and to, to really build the kingdom, to work with Jesus and what he's doing in the world and, and to see lives changed and the kingdom expanded. So that's what I have. Um, I'll just briefly note the, the resources here that I have listed. There's three slides. And again, I'll, I'll give a, a copy to uh, Glenn and he can post a link then. Great. Thank you very much, um, Austin. That was uh, very, very instructive and helpful. So uh, we're going to be opening this up for a question and answer period here very shortly. Anybody that's on here can um, ask questions in real time. And, um, and Austin is here to um, give some thoughts to those things. So I appreciated the thought about how we can be very busy, you know, without being productive. And um, I think that's something that we can, you know, probably all identify with where uh, there's some satisfaction that I'm, I'm busy, but at the same time, a realization that I'm not getting anything done. And so, yeah, I think you did a very good job in um, presenting us with a little battle plan, if you will, to reorient our priorities and um, get our digital lives under control. Yeah, so um, I'd like to open it up here to uh, questions from the audience. And uh, who will be who will be first? Me. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, this is a really, really useful presentation. I want to propose two new terms to empower our vocabularies to proactively cope with digital assaults on our cognitive ability in this post-Orwellian world. Language is being decimated by tiny keypads that make eight out of our 10 digits redundant. I propose to replace new speak with new think, and I propose thumb speak. Uh, I should, I'm sorry. I, I propose to replace new speak and new think with thumb speak and thumb think. That's my comment. And my question is do you have uh, a place in your system for what I learned years ago as Wilfredo Pareto's? 80-20 rule, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know if you had, do you have more a more specific question or are you just asking like, is that something that I've considered in, in how I think about these things? Uh, no, that's, that's as, as specific as I get. Do, do you recognize uh, the 80-20 rule? And if so, do you think it's balderdash or is there a way that you fold that into your program? Yeah, I, I certainly recognize it. And I think there's a lot of validity to it. And so for those of you not familiar with the Pareto principle, it basically says that that 20% of the, sorry, 80% of the problems are caused by 20% of these, these 20, this 20% factor. Um, it's not, it's not something that I've considered a lot in, in this particular regard. Um, but I think that, that really recognizing the, the proclivity of our digital devices, especially notifications and the, the constant barrage, like those few things, like if we can learn to control those, I really think that, that it could give us back far more attention, mental space than, than what we imagine. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. And um, who will be next? Austin, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. It was uh, well needed. I need it. Question for you in the in the do not disturb, turn off notifications in, in that segment of things. For those of us in church leadership, organizational leadership, and maybe this applies to everybody and I just don't realize it, where there's this tacit expectation of being available all the time. Um, do we have to talk to our people and explain this to them? Do we owe them some sort of explanation? Hey, this is my practice. Deal with it. I'm unavailable. Um, how do we manage that expectation that the world has built that 
I'm available 24 seven. Now, personally, I'm a nursing home administrator. I am on call 24 seven. I have to be available to a select group of people, not the world in general, but mm-hmm. outside that very specific select group, how do we manage that expectation? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I think one of the, one of the potential, at least something that starts to answer that is to hold office hours. And even if it doesn't mean that you're physically in an office where people can come to you, even like digital office hours and basically saying, Hey, this is, this is my time window throughout the week where I'm completely available. But on this day and this day, I I need focus time to be able to prepare a sermon or I need focus time to be able to do this. Um, As far as owing people an explanation, um, I think that'll depend some on your audience. Like if, if it's people who recognize the, some of these things that we talked about today, if, if they don't recognize it at all, it, it might be a little more challenging to, to make the need known. Um, so maybe a little bit more work would be needed in that regard. But, but I think, yeah, my short answer would simply be holding some kind of office hours, either where you're completely available or during these times I'm, I'm not. And one thing you mentioned there is, is not being available to the whole world. And I think essentially what social media does is makes us available to the whole world. It makes us, it puts us at the mercy of the whole world. And so I think by tackling that problem, um, we can, we can solve a lot of other issues as well. Hey, Austin, could I uh, kind of make a comment there to what the topic Ryan is asking about? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I love the technology stuff. I'm sitting in my car right now. I'm going to go over to Mount Echo, which is right next to Cincinnati Christian University on the beautiful Ohio River and pray with a friend of mine. But I don't have a smartphone. I've never had one. I'm 61 years old. And when people say why, I just tell them I'm not that important. A little bit like you're asking about, Ryan. And I just give golf lessons. And I'm just a husband and the father of two children. And so I just tell people I'm not that important. And if they're a Christian, I say, well, you know, I consider the Holy Spirit quite valuable that you and I each have. And so I just don't think you need to get a hold of me. You know, if you're a friend and you're a Christian. And then for my golf students, you know, most golf players now, of course, nowadays have their smartphone and they'll answer a call anytime for some guy who needs to cure a golf shot that's bad. I tell my golf students, I said, look, you can figure it out. I'll see you once a month or once a week for a lesson. That's all you need me. I'm not that important. It's your life. You you figure it out. Now, Ryan, again, you're trying to help keep people alive in a nursing home. (laughs) So that's a lot different than my situation. You know, so I can understand why you would need to have a different availability than, than me. But I just tell people I'm not that important. I don't want a smartphone. I don't need it. And, and again, the world leaders have gotten along for centuries without smartphones and thankfully have avoided nuclear war somehow to this point. So they got in touch with each other at the right times. Then surely I can be the same way. So Austin, I really agree with what you're saying about how the first question is, does this align with my values? And, and I really think my value is I'm just not that important. I don't need to be available to these various people. And if they're a Christian, they can be available to the Holy Spirit. And then I want to be available to the Holy Spirit as well. So, and then we can talk when we arrange it. Just like in the old days, you called people, you didn't get an answer. You just call them back a day or two or three later. And again, the Anabaptists have understood this value, especially those who, who have the phone out on the road you know, and, and meet for church twice a month, you know. So um, I'm very thankful that I don't have a smartphone. And uh, Ryan, I appreciate, again, like, and like you've mentioned beautifully today, Austin, we're all in different situations. Thank you, man. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, any more? Who will be next? 
Thank you, Austin, for this talk and, and also for the Q&A, the, the questions and the thoughts that have come in here have been really inspiring. Um, one of the things that, yeah, so I've, I've been slowly nudging the dial on creating more friction in my life. <laughs> I, like, I, I never thought about it in that way, but I really like that idea to create more friction in terms of how easily accessible these things are. And the smartphone is all about being a good way. Being, that's what I, that's, you that's, um, yeah, it's all about um, the smartphones is, has teaches us and portrays um, uh, about ease, right? It's right in your hands and uh, which is the challenge. And um, so creating that friction, that, that really is a good be a takeaway for me um, to continue to put friction in my life in terms of that. Um, and also, uh, and as I was listening to your talk, I was like, ah, this stuff is so hard. Like, I just, it's hard. We don't like friction. We like instant, right there, ease. And um, I thought about this book by Tim Challies on Do More Better. And, 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 then you, and, and you talked about that too, um, uh, the purpose. You know, you, and that's how he starts his book out. Like, if you don't have a purpose, uh, it's, this stuff would be impossible. But if you have a purpose, and don't we as followers of Jesus have the, the, the most um, compelling purpose? in our lives and to advance, to be like Jesus and advance his kingdom. And, um, and so, and then of course you ended with that too, you know, edify the church, change the world. And so thank you for, for this, uh, excellent talk. Right? It's very challenging. And I have a lot of, a lot, a lot of thinking to do on it. Thanks for the feedback. Yes, I can agree with that. Amen. All right. Um, any any further questions or comments? Um, and a couple like Ryan alluded to this, um, and then Joel. Um, thank you, Joel, for your thoughts there. But the idea that we're not that important. Um, but one of the challenges is 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 the you know as as Christians as followers of Jesus and people who are, who care deep about community, um, there can be some incredibly uh, strong expectations on you get pulled into this or and you're part of initiatives that you care deeply about working with other brothers who care deeply about them as well and and the, the challenge is how do i um not break expect you know maybe maybe and it's maybe um uh, a perceived expectation but you don't want to let them down right um you don't want to let them down you want to be there um, and I find that really hard to know how to communicate that where you're not disappointing people or you get put in a WhatsApp group that, you know, you just don't really have any interest in. Um, and, and you have to like remove yourself and there's, there's that stress. Um, maybe some people don't struggle with that, but I, I would love to hear maybe a couple of thoughts from you, Austin, on how, how do we, um, in, in that in, in a relationally connected world with initiatives and church family um, move through some of those. And maybe we kind of dug on that, you know, dug into that already, but any other thoughts there would be appreciated and how you've dealt with that. And, and if, and if I could take that one notch farther, how do we remind ourselves first of all, and then remind our friends that we don't have to attend every argument we're invited to every wackadoodle theory I see online, every blog post, every Facebook post, of just complete boulder dash. I don't have to attend every argument I'm invited to. I don't have to correct the entire world. How do we, how do we build on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I think perhaps one of the, and I would love to hear other people's thoughts too. It's not something that I feel like I have solved in by any stretch. Um, I think it's similar to uh, perhaps one of the key things is to recognize how consistent engagement with social media in particular harms us. I think th there's a fascinating documentary called The Social Dilemma put out by the Center for Humane Technology. It's, it's actually free on YouTube until September 30. I would highly recommend watching that. That really dives into the ways that social media is used to manipulate people 
to think certain things and kind of creates these silos of belief systems that people live in. And the, the news feed in the social media is curated for that person by algorithms. And they're not choosing to see these things per se. It's these, these computer programs that are saying, okay, based on your, your internet choices, your, your history, your clicks, all of this, we think you should see this. And, and really, I think building an understanding behind these social media platforms and how they're optimized for you is really important. Um, I think that would be one of the, the biggest things is to, is to continue to inform people and to be informed. One, one specific thing you mentioned, Brian, was about the WhatsApp groups. Um, one of the things that I've done is simply mute a group. So if you go into group settings, just mute them. And I don't, you know, there you can see that you got a message from them when you open it up, but it's not that constant barrage. And one of the, the things I thought about recently was like, what if I could mute by default everything <laughs> and like each chat in WhatsApp and then unmute the ones that I want? I don't, and I did a little bit of digging. I don't think that's possible, but it would be really neat if it would be. So those would be some of my initial thoughts there. To address Ryan's question, how do you uh, keep out of uh, uh, every argument? Uh, I had to just quit. What I found is a lot of the things that are contradictory to my beliefs that are posted here and there are not really broadcast signals, but they're feedback loop noise. And when I try to contribute, I'm not correcting uh, the signal. I'm adding to the noise. And uh, just like when you have a, a microphone that's too close to a speaker. So I just had to quit. And I don't get involved in those kinds of things unless there's a very specific and particular need to. That is to say, I'm directly requested to do so. And I know that I do have a contribution to that particular individual. I shut up. Thank you, Dan. Uh, there was one question came in by chat here, Austin, and that is, what was the name of that YouTube documentary? The Social Dilemma. Got it. The Social Dilemma. All right, so it's uh, seven minutes after the hour. Um, maybe time for one more question if uh, somebody has one ready. All right, uh, if not, I think what we'll do is ask Austin to close in prayer and then we have one announcement following that. So Austin, go ahead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the challenges before us are great. There are many giants stalking today's world that the devil is using to destroy people. Lord, we, we cry out to you for your wisdom, for your grace, your empowering Holy Spirit to uh, give us the tools that we need, give us the, the, the mental clarity and the sharpness of thought to adequately approach and to address these issues in front of us. Father, we ask that you would give us great fortitude and perseverance and carefulness as we navigate our relationships with our digital tools. We want to live lives that are meaningful and that, that are, are bringing about um, edification of your people, challenging the assumptions that the world has about what it means to be human and that, that truly are a part of your, your peaceful revolution that you're bringing over the world. Father, we plead with you for your grace and we thank you that you have given us all things that we need to live a godly life in Christ. And I pray that each one of us would contemplate our lives and make changes as needed. We ask for grace to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank so like was uh, already mentioned, we're going to be uh, posting notes on our website uh, for the talk here this morning. Uh, that'll be later today. And uh, the website is strengthtostrength.org. So uh, for next week, uh, we have an upcoming talk on the so-called New Apostolic Reformation, sometimes called the NAR. 
And um, unlike many of our presentations where we have one presenter, like we did this morning, uh, we're going to have two. And that is uh, Drew Latin. Many of you may know him from other uh, platforms where he shares Drew Latin as well as Joel Nisley. And uh, together with Bryant as moderator, they're going to be um, hosting a discussion on this. So yeah, looking forward to that. Um, I think that concludes it for today. So again, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your questions. And uh, may the Lord bless your week. God bless you. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend.